right. Good morning. I hope you guys can hear me. It is Wednesday, June 7th. Um, I am having some technical difficulties this morning, and uh, but hopefully we're all here. Hopefully we'll uh, have a good time talking a little bit more about solutions rather than problems today. Um, that's kind of the theme of this Wednesday. Again, we're going through uh, the current debt situation, the budget situation, uh, talked a little bit about on Monday, interest rates, inflation, debt, the history from country to country, all the way going back to uh, the Middle Ages, really, and the Renaissance time period coming up through uh, Great Britain and the rise there and with the Industrial Revolution and then into the United States. Uh, we talked about that on Monday. On Tuesday, we discussed uh, where we are in the current budget situation and what are the real driving factors. And if you recall, uh, we established that, yes, defense spending has grown significantly, non-defense discretionary spending has grown significantly, but it's really been the entitlement program, Social Security and major health care, which are the primary drivers uh, over the last 10, 20 years of the rising deficit. And then especially as we look into 2033, uh, they're not only growing faster than the rest of the budget, but they're also now becoming uh, such an overwhelming part of the budget. They're just trying to, they're gobbling up all the dollars that are available. So uh, today we're going to present some solutions. These solutions are uh, our grand plan for fixing the situation, as we call it. Um, but, uh, you know, I would say the big takeaway here is that we want to look for uh, policies that will promote things like what we're going to be talking about today uh, in terms of if you want to fix the situation, which I think that we all kind of would like to do. Uh, these are directionally uh, what might be required. So we're going to put put forth a proposal um, with the full humility and understanding that we're not you know a lot we don't really fully understand the situation like some of the politicians might uh, and the and the players involved but uh here we go so um number one we really need to control spending on major health care um we need to limit spending and growth on major health care to 4.2 percent per year uh this would be down uh over the last from between 2003 and projected through 2033, the expectation is that major healthcare spending will be up 7% per year. Now, we all know that GDP, our economy does not support that growth. You cannot just grow 7% in perpetuity and not expect uh, major healthcare to just completely take over as a percentage of the economy. In fact, by 2033, uh, if the trends continue and the Congressional Budget Office is correct, then major health care will take up 8% of GDP. And this is just government programs. This is just government spending on, medic on major health care. This does not include, is, excuse me, federal government spending. It does not include what states do for Medicaid. It does not include what you pay for private insurance. It does not include your co-pays. And if you compare this to some uh, countries with socialized medicine, uh, it's actually our spending on major healthcare as a percentage of the economy is not that different. Uh, but what we do is we also spend on um, private insurance and we spend on, on private pay and we do all these other things. And basically what that is to say, it's not to say we need to go to a socialized uh, program, but it is to say that we're probably spending a bit too much here. And there are probably ways to cut down, uh, in, including on pharmaceuticals, including on middlemen, uh, including on the HMOs, which are now really big players on the Medicare space. So uh, I think this is all um, this is all good stuff to talk about. And if we could limit spending growth on major health care to 4.2 percent per year rather than the current rate, then uh, you would cut your deficit dramatically uh, by the time you reach 2033. In fact, you'd cut it by half of the entire defense budget. Um, so this is really some, some low-hanging fruit. And again, this is not cutting Medicare, period. This is just cutting the growth so that it grows with the economy versus growing almost twice as fast as the economy. 
Uh, next thing we need to do is we need to increase growth. Um, so in economics, you really talk about three ways of doing this. You improve the labor supply, you improve capital availability, and you improve productivity. Improving the labor supply is difficult um, because the population is kind of baked into the cake. Because even if we have a massive baby boom today, we're not getting people really enter the workforce for another 18 years. Uh, so what you can do today, however, is you can increase immigration and, and you can increase legal immigration. One way you can do that is increase the number of visas. The last president to do that was George Bush Sr. He doubled the number of visas in 1990 that were available, and it really helped uh, boost the economy. And if you look at what happened in the 1990s, we really had some good economic growth uh, in part as a result of that. And if you look historically through the United States, one of the trademarks of what we've been able to do is we've really become a place where uh, legal immigrants can come and contribute to the economy and, and really grow it. And you know, because right now, one of the issues that we have is we have 1.8 job openings for every unemployed person. We need more workers in the economy, and that would be one way of doing it. Uh, you also need to become a little bit more tax friendly on the corporate tax rate side. Uh, I see a potential for us to potentially bring more corporations back into the United States, attract more companies uh, to invest in the United States. And part of that is also due to regulation, uh, making regulations a little bit easier, a little less onerous. Um, if you look at some of the, the polling data that we have in, in terms of how the degree of regulation that we have, we only rank 21st in the in, in the world. Um, Singapore is the best. Australia is number four. Um, Germany is number 12. So we can really improve uh, our ability to uh, effectively regulate companies um, and, and make things a little bit easier on them. Uh, you can also improve capital availability with more trade with other, other countries, uh, you know, better better trade zones where uh, we're really uh, accessing some of that capital a little bit cheaper and more freely available. And, and you think, you know, people talk about a housing shortage in the United States. One example of this is, you know, if we can increase immigration, if we can increase the availability of capital, if we can lower regulations on lumber and, and things like this and, and zoning issues, then we can really dramatically take down the cost of home construction. And, you know, you can build a lot of homes. They're not going to be fancy homes, but you can build houses uh, that uh, people can live in for, for cheaper, um, which could really help to catap uh, catapult new household formation, and it can increase growth as well. And then we need to improve productivity. Uh, one way we can do that is actually making the job market more competitive. Um, make sure that companies have the ability to fire people and, and hire people who can really contribute to it. We, it needs to become cultural. Uh, we need to have a mindset of productivity in the country that we don't really have right now. Um, right now, productivity, total factor productivity is quite low. Uh, it's, I think it's adding about 0.3 or 0.4% to GDP per year. Um, we need to increase that. It would be great to increase that to 1%. And we'll talk a little bit more about the details here. So in becoming more jobs friendly, uh, our proposal would be if you eliminated the corporate income tax and uh, made all capital gains ordinary income, uh, increase the payroll tax uh, by 2%, as you, as you might expect, given what we have, the situation we have in Medicare and Social Security, and also increase the Social Security age by one year, uh, that's all tax neutral. And you've eliminated the corporate income tax. You've eliminated that idea of double taxation. Um, and now all of a sudden we have zero corporate tax and you are providing a great place for companies to come invest and hire people. Uh, you can increase the net migration from 0.3 to 0.7 percent, uh, which would correspondingly should help uh, GDP growth um, and also boost income tax revenue. And so the combination of all of this uh, becoming more jobs friendly would help to reduce 
the deficit. We you remember we've already cut the spending on growth on Medicare. All of a sudden now, instead of a deficit of one point five trillion dollars in uh, twenty thirty three, our deficit's now point six trillion. So now we've cut it by two thirds. And then you improve capital availability and productivity. Um, right now, the Congressional Budget Office says that we're going to be underutilized for the next 10 years uh, by about 0.7%. So cut that. Make sure that we're firing on all cylinders. Uh, so now uh, cut our output gap to just two tenths. Increase our total factor productivity through lower regulation and, and uh, a better mix of uh, of productivity from capital to labor. And now when you do all that, uh, your deficit is now just $183 billion in 2033. So this is what it looks like. Remember, we increased the capital gains uh, tax to make it ordinary income, uh, which, you know, how difficult is that going to get through? I mean, it would be incredibly difficult because you have a lot of private equity companies that would not like that very much. Um, uh, Warren Buffett might like it because now he pays more than his secretary. But apart from him, I'm not sure if anyone would be too keen on that, especially in the investing donor class. Uh, payroll taxes would increase. Um, again, that that's 1% on the employer side, 1% on the employee side. But again, that comes with the elimination of the corporate tax rate. So uh, that would be how you're uh, a little bit tax neutral there. And then the upside comes from uh, growth of the economy in terms of revenue. And then again, uh, cutting a little bit on the Social Security side by extending the age by one year and then uh, reducing those major health care costs. So you can see how all of that shakes out in, in these budgets. So again, this is just one, one potential solution, um, but these are ways that you can actually get toward a balanced budget um, by making some changes today. And it would still take 10 years, uh, but by 2035, you'd actually be in a budget surplus. So this is a summary of where we, we came. Your, your debt to GDP, instead of being 133%, would now be 89%. And by 2043, you'd have a debt to GDP of 44%. This would be a little bit faster than the timeline in which uh, the U, uh, Great Britain took its debt to GDP ratio from over 200% to 40% in the 1800s. So it's been done before, it can be done again, but you need growth and you need some reform on entitlement spending. So with that, uh, we'll leave it there. Tomorrow, we'll discuss the reserve currency status, what it is and what does it mean, um, and whether or not the United States will be able to maintain that in future years. So thanks for joining us. Hope this was helpful. Um, I am ruling out a run for president in 2024, uh, but you know, happy to, ha ha happy, to, happy to share any of this data or, or these spreadsheets with you if you're interested. Um, but we'll leave it there for now. See you tomorrow.